So the Yankees settled with eight out of their nine um, arbitration eligible players. Um, they had previously come to terms with IKF, strangely, uh, right after the season ended one year for $6 million. Uh, the Yankees were like, yep, yeah, we want IKF back. Um, but however, some of the other mainstays, they left go until um, the arbitration deadline this past week. So they settled with eight out of the nine eligible players. That included uh, Michael King uh, for $1.3 million. All of these are one-year deals to avoid arbitration. And for anyone who doesn't know, um, the arbitration process is where basically the player and their agency uh, presents a value that they think they're worth, and then the team presents a value that they think that player is worth, and then a private arbiter, like a, a judge-type scenario, they literally go to court, determines which of those two numbers best fits the player statistically relative to the market. So um, that's a court process that you don't really want to go through with your players, um, so the Yankees settled most of these deals to avoid that arbitration process. And if you remember, uh, Aaron Judge almost went through it in June before the Yankees settled, uh, days before the deadline. That was pushed back into the season because of the um, because of the lockout. But Michael King uh, for 1.3, Johnny Loisca for 2.3, Wandy Peralta 3.3, Nestor Cortez signed a 3.3 million, and he came out on Twitter. Uh, and he said some really nice things. Um, Nestor Cortez has been a really good starting pitcher for the last three years, getting paid about 500000 450000 whatever the major league minimum is. Um, so he got a big payday, and, and uh, I appreciate how much he appreciated. You know, That's yeah. life-altering money, even though it's relatively low when we talk about these professional players. I would take $3.2 million. I'm sure you would also, Jake. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, and you also have to take into <laughs> obviously with uh, my pre 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 arb situation going on here, um, going into <laughs> potentially surgery, that would be pretty nice right now. Um, <laughs> but like on top of that, you've got New York state taxes. And then I believe you play uh, pay tax in every state that you played in throughout the season. Yep. So there's a lot that goes into it. And the fact that he's making, I think the league minimum right now, is 770. Yeah. So 770,000 after um, the new CBA. Yep. Um, that's a huge step up for him, and he deserved every penny. Yeah, and same with guys: Clay Holmes, uh, three point three, Trevino, two point four, Higgy, one point four, uh, Montas got seven point five, Herman. Um, but the one person they didn't settle with, uh, was Glaber Torres. And right now, the Yankees and Glaber Torres are a little bit split. Uh, the Yankees think Glaber is worth nine point seven. These are the reports. Um, and. Glaber's camp think he's worth 10.2. I imagine uh, maybe they'll eventually settle before the court date. Um, but they're they've decided to go through the arbitration process. And I think that's interesting because uh, one of the reasons I thought that the Yankees settled with IKF is to make uh, his trade value more certain. Um, yeah. Teams generally wouldn't want to take on a player that they have to go to court with immediately. Um, and that would be the case for any team taking on Glaber unless the Yankees look to shop him until after that arbitration court date. Um, but Glaber is that player you were alluding to from our position of surplus to the Marlins position of need. I mean, right now uh, the Marlins roster resource, they have Gene Segura at third um, after trading Miguel Rojas to LA. They have Jazz Chisholm at second and Joey Wendell as their shortstop. Um, Glaber Torres would move Chisholm to short, which is where he came up. Um, and then Glaber would probably play second because he's a better fielder than Gene Segura. Yeah. Um, but yeah, what do you think of a Glaber Torres deal like for Pablo Lopez, uh, like for anyone on that Marlins staff, like we had previewed in November? I think they should have pulled the trigger on it personally back in uh, July, like because it seems like they had the framework for uh, 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 deal in place i think it had to include peraza though which is why the yankees didn't want to move on it um but it feels imminent that the infield this year is going to at some point include volpe at second base and peraza at short like that just it the writing is on the wall at this point they're call, they're labeling um volpe and mr yankee at this at this rate um and they clearly love peraza because they did give him playoff run he eventually did uh, replace IKF, but it was too late at that point. But he every time that Peraza was on the field, he dazzled. Um, I, it's clear as day that they're going to be running out of spaces for infielders 
And with Donaldson having such a tough contract to move, I think they're still trying to move it. Don't get me wrong. But obviously, Glaber is the one that has the most value out of anyone at this point that is majorly proven. He's going to give you at least, what, a 115 WRC plus, something along those lines. He's at least 15%, 20% better than the average player. Um, But he has his ups and his downs, and I think that New York City sometimes gets to be too much for him. So this could be a good opportunity for him to go to a bit of a smaller, more laid-back market. Um, I think he's a perfect match for the Marlins. If we're being like just in terms of an organizational fit, I think he'll feel a little bit less pressure and play a little bit more loose than he does in New York City. Um, I think it's an outstanding fit. And I think that there are plenty of pieces that could go back and forth on return for. And especially like, do you fully trust Jazz Chisholm being your main like player in the like positionally speaking for the Marlins right now? He's not played a full season yet. He has supreme talent potentially. Or Joey right, Wendell as your that. lockdown shortstop after Miguel Rojas, who has been a an elite defender there for the past five plus years. Yeah, so you're losing that big staple that you had. And like I think Glaber, even though he is what, 26, 25 years old at this point, he's accumulated enough experience to be a veteran presence for guys like Jazz Chisholm to look up to. So I think that he provides more value overall for the Marlins than the Yankees. So I really hope that the Yankees see it the same way. And I think they do because like that they were hesitant to pull the trigger on a $10 million deal. So there clearly is something that's holding them back from just committing to him. Yeah. And I generally agree with you. So I'm going to bring up a counterpoint from outside so that we can have some interesting discourse here. Um, (laughs) Someone that we listen to a bunch is prominent in Yankees land is obviously John boy um, from talking Yanks podcast and talking baseball. So recently there have been, uh, Glaber rumors have been big on Twitter, I think, for valid reasons, like what we just outlined. Um, another part of that is that Glaber is going to get in the area of $10 million, which right now, by most projections, would put the Yankees at around $271, $272 million, um, including the uh, the major league minimums from the rest of the 40-man guys who are like on high options, you know, like uh, – Floreal, uh, Oswaldo, Peraza, Volpe, whoever that may be. Um, yeah. So that puts the Yankees dangerously close to that 273 threshold, which is that second level tax threshold. Now, um, where John Boy comes from, he disagrees that we should trade Glaber. He thinks that we should keep Glaber at all costs. And what his view is, DJ's injury uncertainty, which is really valid. Um, apparently, all signs are pointing good. He didn't need surgery. So he'll be ready for the year. But we saw how DJ being down really impacted this team. So if we didn't have Glaber last year, who plays second? My answer to that is I'm ready for Anthony Volpe. But it's also that's a new level prospect, you know, in a team that's in win now mode. Glaber is proven to be like a 700, 750 OPS level guy, even though there are ups and downs that go from 900 to 550 in between there. Um, so Glaber kind of holds it down with the uncertainty of, of DJ's injury. Um, yeah. And also John Boyd, uh, which is a valid point. He doesn't like to think about the money being a big issue. Um, he kind of just wishes that the, the the Steinbrenners who have billions and billions of dollars would be fine going a little bit over that second tax threshold when Steve Cohen is paying 350 yeah. plus million. Um, so I see where he's coming from there. So like in my headspace, I think – uh, Glaber is our most valuable uh, asset um, in terms of someone who's in a position of surplus, who's major league proven, uh, who's young and has a lot of upside for a young team like Miami. So that's where I see he fits. But I understand the point um, of, of DJ and not wanting to part ways with Glaber. Yeah. And also one thing about Glaber that is a huge plus, and this also ties into that previous point as well, is that he stays healthy. and. Yeah. That's one of the biggest things you can ask for from a player nowadays. Like he'll, he can give you 150 games easy, um, which, which is you cannot very, take for granted. Yeah. It's we give a labor lot. a lot of slack, but that, that's huge. That, that's one yeah. of the most valuable parts of a player. That's why Robbie Cano was so important for us back in the early to late 2000s, you know, um, 161 so, games every year. Exactly. That's such a satisfying number to see on the back of a baseball card or a baseball <laughs> reference too. Like, Oh, that's, that's so satisfying. He always got off one of the last series. <laughs> I distinctly yeah. remember from like 08 to like 2012, 
basically Robbie Cano played like 158 to like 161 games. Never 162, I think. Maybe he got one of them in there. Matsui had the 163 game season. I was like, you're a psycho, dude. He he's like in the modern game, he would never. He'd be playing 135. Yeah. Maybe 150 with DHing. Easy. That's so funny. Here we go. Uh oh my god, it went back even farther. 2007, 160. 08, 159. 09, 161 led the league. Uh 10, 160. 11, 159. 12, 161. 13, 160. 14, 157 with Seattle. I love it. And then the steroids hit. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, it's like when you I don't know, when you can see that a player puts that much into being on the field, it's definitely a huge asset. Um, so I'm sure that's another reason the Yankees are kind of trigger shy at this point to pull something right now although i think the fact that montas so what scared me the most about the montas news is that apparently he's six to eight weeks behind schedule which is a significant amount of time if you think about how long he's been shut down for so that gives me no hope that he's going to be back at this point point. and that's um, two months into pitchers and catchers like pitchers and catchers report two weeks early yeah. just so they can throw and then the rest of the team comes because then they get into their work so yeah. if montas is realistically going to be starting his spring training program as the yankees are starting opening day he's going to be about two months plus behind yeah so i feel like they're really feeling the pressure right now to make something happen and i i'm sure that they would be okay with going in with Mon- uh, with mingo and with clark kind of platooning each other but at the same time, like you, if you can get a proven starter um, who could be a fresh take for the organization, especially someone who would be a new arm that hasn't pitched too much in the AL East, just to give a different look, I think that's worth the shot. Those Miami pitchers are way too compelling for me to just like pass up on. So who would be your pitcher of choice? Because we got two lefties. There's Lazardo, there's Trevor Rogers. Um, and then on the board, I would say Edward Cabrera and Pablo Lopez. Um, I don't know how they feel about Braxton Garrett, who's listed as their number six. Um, I know Garrett's also supposed to be pretty talented, too. Um, I think that I would have – we have two lefties already that I love in this rotation. And as I am a lefty, as much as I love lefties, I don't think we need another one right now, although like I wouldn't be mad about it. But um, I think Pablo gives you that stability that's very important right now. And that's what you're like the lack or the uncertainty is what scares Yankees fans and the Yankees the most at this moment. I think Pablo gives you 180 innings easy. Um, So that's the guy that I think he would also cost the least because he's the least amount of control. So he's a pretty easy no brainer for me. Although I would be very happy to see someone like an Edward Cabrera just because the upside is so high, but are you looking? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, go ahead. I was going to say, are you looking at Pablo Lopez's baseball reference right now? I am not. Okay. Gonna... How many innings? No, don't look it up. How many okay. innings do you think he threw last year? 185. You said 180? He threw 180.0 innings last year. <laughs> <There you go. laughs> so that was a good pull. That was I, I that just caught me by surprise because I just opened it up and then you said 180. Well, and like, just think about it that way is like, how many did uh, Tyone give us like 170 last season, something yep. like that, maybe like this is a step up from that. And he's a, a like, I love JMO, but he's a better pitcher than that as well. Yep. And he's young, he's 26, 27 years old. So he has upside and like it, get him with Matt Blake. This dude can really kind of skyrocket. I mean, Brandon Marlins, all credit to them. They've got an outstanding pitching staff and the way that they run their pitching development is probably better than most teams. But Matt Blake working with him on spin rate and things along those lines like that, he can really benefit being around guys like Garrett Cole and then Carlos Rodon. And also Nestor Cortez, because he's kind of got a little bit of everything. He is a finesse guy, but he can have some he has some power in there, that arm as well. So I think that he is a really nice blend of what the Yankees are working with at the moment. On Tuesday, April 4th, I am going to see Yankees versus Phillies. That is their fifth game of the season. Who throws the first pitch of that game in pinstripes? I'm going to dream big and say Pablo. Pablo Lopez? Our yeah. friend, Pablo Lopez? Friend of the pod. Friend of the pod, Pablo Lopez. He just doesn't know it yet. <laughs> um, 
We gotta get it. if he if he becomes a Yankee, we actually have to FaceTime him. Oh my um, god. Shout Jay out to Ray Jay Ray for that connection. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 